everyone's searching for something. Fulfillment. The Kings of the North Alliance wins! They win TI3! Fame. PPT, here comes the Ice Blast, ready for the dunk! Here from the universe, it's a disaster! Satisfaction. Grand champions of TIA! It's OG! Gives you the ability to become someone else. A someone who is powerful. Back you in! Gravage on everyone! The Black Hole as well! Flight of Evan turns it around! Gravage as well! Stolen by Danny! Are you kidding me? They turn it around! Four heroes! Who can take down five opponents. But he's chunking them down! And oh. win the fight! It's a rampage! Express their creativity. Boulder offer, he jumps in! Where's the egg? Is he Break the rules without actually getting arrested. Still hasn't even been used. There's a hook. How? Brought all the way back to the base. Cleaned up by the fountain. All of these reasons are in there somewhere. The player himself might not even know. He might not even understand it himself. But it's there. Defense of the Ancients, also known as Dota, was first introduced as a mod for Warcraft 3 Reign of Chaos back in 2002. It took inspiration from a custom StarCraft map called Aeon of Strife, a co-op mode in which four players faced off against an endless wave of computer-controlled units across several lanes. From the beginning, especially offered something that other games didn't really have. Dota was created with Warcraft 3's World Editor, which turned the game's existing assets into a variety of unique heroes and items. It was the first in a long line of multiplayer online battle arenas, better known now as MOBAs. Dota has such a scattered, scattershot history, it was originally developed by a lot of different people, and eventually a guy named Yule stepped up and took lead. The objective of the game was simple destroy the enemy team's Ancient, a structure which sat behind towers and waves of units. But the execution was a different story. Dota was always a very difficult game and a kind of hard game to get into, uh, especially if you're a casual gamer. Players would need to choose a character from hundreds of heroes, amass gold and experience by killing player and computer-controlled units, and outfit them with items and unique abilities in the hopes of achieving glory. I think that Dota really you know, brought something new to the table where, where it was even harder to some extent to, to play on a team uh, and, and, and make it work. The advent of Dota marked the birth of an entirely new multiplayer experience. It was like an RTS, but better. It had the complexity of a game like StarCraft, but with a welcome reduction in actions per minute. More importantly, it introduced the element of team play to a genre that had always been designed around individual play. I see it in a lot of ways similar to basketball, just like a five-on-five -five game where you kind of have to work together and utilize each other's strengths and synergizing everything together. The teamwork and the trust and the sacrifice, uh, those are all true for every single team sport. Although the first ever iteration of Dota was released by Kyle Yule Sommer, it wasn't until the release of Warcraft 3 Frozen Throne in 2003 that the genre truly began to take off. Given that Yule had stopped supporting his own mod, other map makers were left to produce spin-offs that added additional heroes and items, amongst other features. The most popular of those spin-offs was Dota All-Stars, given that it took everyone's favorite additions and compiled them into a single downloadable map. Everyone that played the game, everyone that you know, had been part of it, saw something special in this game. All-Stars quickly established itself as Dota's quintessential iteration, and in March 2004, the map's development was taken over by Steve Ginsu Feek, one of Dota's most influential designers. From item recipes to the mighty Roshan himself, Ginsu was responsible for ideating and implementing some of Dota's most integral and iconic features, and oversaw the game's development until February 2005. Then Ginsu handed over the reins to two of his longtime contributors. The first was Nykus, who, after making a series of significant contributions, eventually became disenchanted with the project. But the second would go on to become Dota's longest standing designer, a mysterious, anonymous visionary whose real identity remains closely guarded to this day. He is simply known as Icefrog. 
So he, he will always work around balancing also connected to like everything that makes Dota special and everything that makes the heroes special. Um, and that's something I think he has done really well. And it was under Ice Frog's direction that Dota blossomed into both an international sensation <laughs> and a bona fide esport. When the prizes started coming, I was like, oh, well, we have like tournaments, so obviously some people is going to come and say, like, well, this is a great game, let's play it, like, let's put money in it. And it started progressing each year. Over the course of the mid to late 2000s, Dota became one of the biggest games in the world. By 2009, the game's de facto community hub, DotaAllStars.com, boasted about a million and a half registered users and received nearly a million unique visitors each month. The issue was that, technically speaking, Dota wasn't a game. It was a mod that couldn't be marketed, sold, or commodified since it was constructed entirely out of Blizzard-owned assets. But its earth-shattering success was too enticing to ignore. After founding Riot Games in 2006, Mark Trindamir Merrill and Brandon Rise Beck enlisted the help of two veterans who'd worked on the original Dota to create and release the game's first spiritual successor in 2009. League of Legends is a uh, multiplayer competitive session-based action RPG that is sort of considered the spiritual successor to the uh, popular Warcraft 3 mod, Defense of the Ancients. Some very notable Dota figures or Dota community figures are or have key roles in uh, in the development of League of Legends. So Steve Pendragon is gone, and then on the design side, Steve Ginsu Feek, and he's uh, the gentleman who's really leading the design vision uh, on League of Legends and has a very key role. Tensions arose in the community when, in anticipation of League's release, Pendragon, who'd been tasked with running Dota's de facto website, shut it down and replaced it with a banner promoting Riot's upcoming product. It's been alleged on several occasions that during this time, Icefrog had been secretly working with S2 Games, whose slightly more faithful Dota spin-off, Heroes of New Earth, was released in 2010. Ally yourself with the Legion or the Hillborn. To prevail, you must preserve your stronghold. Icefrog denied the allegation, claiming that S2 had merely asked him for permission to create a Dota lookalike, and that he viewed the competition as a good thing. Uh, I played quite a lot of Hon, and I usually say that it's like it was like Dota on crack or something like that. Like everybody's just going around on their rollerblades, being super fast, and the map felt smaller, and and all the spells were instant cast. About a year after League of Legends' release, it and Han had cut Dota's website traffic by nearly half, with the former having all but dethroned Dota as the world's go-to MOBA. League of Legends uh, is attempting to be the answer to those needs that the community is looking for, essentially uh, you know, looking to solve the pain points of Dota and to appeal to a much wider audience. The reason for this was simple. Compared to Dota, which was still running on Warcraft 3's engine, League was more polished, streamlined, and most importantly, a standalone title. It was also easier to play, as it either simplified or removed many of Dota's beautifully complex mechanics. It's a big focus for us in League of Legends to really try to uh, lower the barrier to entry and to appeal to a much wider audience. The result of this simplification was twofold. On the one hand, League achieved widespread commercial success. On the other, it left a sour taste in the Dota community's mouths. Is they're trying to imitate what All Stars already did, but they don't have the same creative process behind them, so you can't expect the same result. With League on the rise and Han becoming increasingly popular, the fear was that Dota, the game that gave birth to the MOBA genre, was on the decline, that Ice Frog's genius would be wasted on an outdated mod. And it was then, when all looked to be lost, that the unlikeliest of saviors stepped in to make every Dota player's dream a reality. What does a hero truly mean? That is for you to decide. In October 2009, Icefrog published a forum post announcing that he'd been hired by renowned game developer Valve to create a true successor to Dota one that would keep intact all of the game's original heroes, items, features, and mechanics. And they contacted Icefrog, you know, hoping that he would reply, because they were game developers as well. 
Uh, and he started talking about what he wanted to do with the sequel, and they said, oh, we have a great idea. Why don't, why don't you come here uh, to Valve and we can all build this together. The only issue was its name. Since Defense of the Ancients was technically owned by Blizzard, Valve couldn't use it. The term Dota, on the other hand, was something that Blizzard was willing to look the other way on as long as it didn't stand for anything. But it was simple, weighty, and said everything it needed to. Dota 2. One is to you know build the the sequel that Ice Frogs wanted to build uh, for what he was doing with with Dota, and then in addition to the you know the tens of millions of people who are already playing that is also try to figure out how to make the experience uh, more accessible to new players. From the very outset, it was clear that Valve had given Ice Frog all the resources needed to create a worthy successor to the original Dota. Valve wanted Dota 2's debut to be big. So before the game had officially released, they decided to organize a tournament where the world's best Dota teams could simultaneously try out the new game and vie for the coveted Aegis of Champions. They called it the International. A tournament summoning the finest Dota teams from across the globe. The inaugural International was held at Gamescom 2011 and was single-handedly shoutcasted by Toby, Toby Wan Dawson. It's the first time we're gonna see teams of this caliber assembled in one location. Everything about it sounded exciting, though not particularly out of the ordinary. Then came the kicker. Watch the forums go nuts, guys. Watch the forums go nuts. It is actually confirmed. It is off the frickin' hook. 1.6 million dollar prize pool. The International wouldn't just be the biggest tournament in Dota, but the biggest tournament in the history of esports. We are now at the final day of the International Dota 2 Championships. It is Na'Vi. We have a one game advantage sitting very, very sweetly in the grand final. Who will get a shot at the 1 million dollars? The onslaught will continue. The mid tower is already been the tier 4 tower is going to go down and running in right now is the rest of Na'Vi. They're running forward to $1 million and they will get it. The GG is the call from Eherm. Na'Vi have just won $1 million. Eherm do take home $250,000 in second place, but Na'Vi are the champions. With the issuing of one check, Valve had made Dota 2, a game that wasn't even out yet, the single most lucrative esport on the planet. There's moments of esports that are landmark, and this is one of them in Cologne and Navi, the winners. You guys have just made history. The beauty of the international was in the message it sent. It told the world that Dota 2 wasn't just another esport, it was the esport. The only MOBA, the only game in which winning a world championship wouldn't just allow you to make a living. It would change your life. Price money has always been a huge part of it because when you can make so much money that it will change your life for the rest of your life, uh, it brings a special kind of flair to it, I think. A month after the inaugural International came to a close, Valve put Dota 2 into open beta, and unlike League of Legends, Valve didn't put playable characters behind paywalls, making Dota 2 an entirely free-to-play experience. Despite its difficulty, the game quickly gained popularity, favorable reviews, and media attention. Have you ever heard of the video game, it's called Dota 2? I, I, not until 5.45 this morning when I got the email. <laughs> I had not. In full disclosure, I <laughs> had never heard of it as well, but I'm learning it is a huge deal. But it would take nearly two years of testing and a second international before the game was given a full retail release a month before the third international. Everything hangs in the balance. It all comes down to this. One more game, two million dollars on seconds. the table. Winner, first place at the International, the Aegis and the prestige Five of being the best Dota 2 team in the world. To this day, TI3 remains one of the most important events in the history of Dota. He's got BKB, but no boots of travel. Oh, Coil on two. Just sustain these CP as well. They are in now huge in Funnix, trouble. Funix caught. Now if they go for the throne, it could be game. Funix down. Alliance are doing it. They need a little more. The ghost to fall. Throne in jeopardy. There's a glyph. It could be their last stand. 
Extend he's back. He's gonna try to focus everybody, but there's so much stuff the hitting on the side. throne. There's no more glyph available. Down to a half HP, a quarter HP. Alliance surrounding him from all sides. They can't be. They want to do round. it. They're gonna do it. The They're gonna do it. The North. Alliance wins. The they win. Ti three. In addition to boasting one of the greatest finals of all time, it was the tournament for which Valve unveiled what is perhaps their single most significant contribution to esports, the Compendium. Every time that you guys play a match or create an item or contribute to the Compendium, you're helping make Dota better for the rest of us. Valve structured it so that $2.50 from each Compendium sale would be contributed to the tournament's prize winnings. They also set up stretch goals which, when reached, would award owners with additional skins, couriers, HUDs, and in-game taunts. When you play with Lena, you tend to get burned. The compendium raised TI3's prize pool to a staggering $2.8 million, $1.2 million over TI1 and 2. Over the next year, Dota 2 saw a surge in popularity from competitors. Yeah. <laughs> to content creators. Hey, hello everybody, this is Bird bringing you a first person gameplay commentary. I'm gonna be trying to do a mid-dragonite. To cosplayers. Coming up, we have Vera, a temporary assassin nightshade set from Dota 2. It felt as if Dota was once again solidifying itself as the world's quintessential MOBA. Dota 2 kinda was born and Dota 1 was reborn with TI1. Um, so, it's, so it's so much more than just the World Cup. It's, it's, it's a part of us now. By TI4, the tournament's prize pool had gone from an already unparalleled $2.8 million to an earth-shattering $10 million. Despite the tournament's famously awful finals, it saw five professional gamers emerge not only as superstars, but actual millionaires. The two play for the GG! 15 minutes in, it's over! Newbie convincingly moving their way through the win. As the game's peak player count continued to skyrocket, reaching a record high 1.2 million in February of 2015, so too did the international's importance as the be-all and end-all of Dota. Every TI brings something good. Uh, it's, it's such a nice event, as in everything is done very professionally. Uh, it's, it's just about Dota, there's no other games, there's nothing else. like. Everybody's there for this game, the game that you've been playing for so long. Come TI5, the purse had shot up to a stunning $18 million. And soon after Evil Geniuses walked away with the most coveted championship in competitive gaming, it became clear the International had become the most magical two weeks on the esports calendar. Biggest tournament in esports, uh, every year is the biggest tournament in esports. It's made out to be such a big thing. Being a TI, you know, it's, it's not only the World Cup, it's like the, the festival of Dora but it was also the most destructive. Um, everything for like the next couple of weeks was just too surreal and then there's some major changes. <laughs> we ended up releasing AUI and bringing in our old teammate Arteezy to play with us. And um, it's just kind of what we, everyone on our team thought was best for us going into this next year. Every second place in TI or below that, it's, it's a lose, like a big lose. And uh, if you're not a winner, then Nobody's looking at you anymore. Everybody feels like uh, it, they feel like nobody's except the winners. I feel that's that's how I think the season comes down to at least. Ti turned professional Dota into a never-ending sea of roster shuffles, a soap opera in which kicking and backstabbing were par for the course, a wild west in which player contracts, sponsorships, and friendships meant nothing, an esport in which literally everything revolved around a single tournament. Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's a very beautiful game and it allows you to express yourselves in so many ways and I think TI is, is the place to do it because that's where everybody is also, you know, trying to show their best, like trying to really get themselves out there like, this is what I've been playing Dota for 10 years for, this is what I can do, can you do it better than me? And then that's when the best team wins. It had become apparent that if Dota was to continue to grow, a redistribution of wealth was in order. It's first place, it's go big or go home. The big teams get big money, but the 9th to 16th place are nothing, and their salaries are not worth considering. While in sports, you have a salary that you can live off. That changing the lives of five players while the rest struggled to earn annual incomes wasn't a sustainable way to build a competitive infrastructure. Something needed to change. 
Following TI5, Valve was determined to bring Dota to the next level. They started by releasing Reborn, the single largest gameplay update Dota had seen in nearly a decade. This is stuff we've been waiting for for a long ass time. Mm -hmm. And they just wanted to amalgamate it into a giant ass patch, which All they right. have done. Nicknamed Dota 3 by the community, Dota 7.0 update brought the game into the Source 2 engine, redesigned its user interface, introduced the first non-Dota All-Stars hero, and outfitted each hero with their own talent tree. Next, Valve unveiled the Dota Major Championships, a series of multi-million dollar tournaments that would be scattered throughout the year, culminating in the international itself. RG have got it! They've got the TG out from Secret! RG, they fight all the way through the lower bracket and will be clean the champions of the first ever Dota 2 Major live here in Frankfurt! With the help of Reborn, the introduction of Majors, and the evolution of the Battle Pass, 2016 became Dota 2's single most successful year to date. As TI6 grew near, it felt as if the game's professional scene had achieved some much needed stability, given that OG had won two of the three Majors. OG are doing it, Liquid! They can withstand the punishment! OG are the Manila Major Champions! Second time! the first ever team to repeat. And then in typical TI fashion, none of the teams who were supposed to win even came close. OG, Newbie, LGD, and Secret imploded at various points in the tournament, failed to make top eight, and gutted their rosters immediately after it ended. I ideally had this team in my head when TI5 was over, that I had a team that I could play with for 10 years, and I still feel like it's, it's the same. I, I do not know what the future holds, like, even for myself, you know, you, you never know. Instead, TI6 found the unlikeliest of champions. Tech, now the last serve, they found Tosca, we are ripped apart, the buybacks, it won't be enough to game of play, Wings are your international 2016 champions! Despite making one of the greatest TI runs of all time, Wings were a largely unknown roster. They turned down sponsorships and streaming contracts in an effort to focus on playing. Wings reminded the world that TI is a fickle, untamable beast. A battle royale in which anyone can emerge victorious. Right. The international is the big one. You can win as many mages as you want, her, but if you take TI, you become immortal. From a spectator standpoint, TI's unpredictability is a good thing. Dota is its own animal. Every single game of Dota is different. And mm. after every patch, it takes months to figure out what's the optimal strategy. But from a business standpoint, it's a nightmare. How is an owner or sponsor expected to enter an esport where contracts and consistency had little to no bearing on a team's ability to win a world championship? Better yet, why would they? Very important for, for teams or organizations such as ours to to have this outside framework built around Dota so that we don't lose our investment from one day to the next or whenever TI is over or if we fail to qualify for TI. By March 2017, Dota's peak player count had fallen below a million for the first time in over a year. And by TI7, its average player count had decreased by over 100,000. There's always gonna be enough players will just never be as big as it was. And that's the critical point to where the shift comes. When do you take something from the community? Or when is, when is something visibly taken that makes you look weak and nothing is put in its place? Much of Dota 2's initial player base had been made up of those who grew up on All-Stars. And after nearly six years, Valve still hadn't found a way to make the game accessible to new players. No! I don't have a CC, sorry dude, I'm that far. Yeah, I just got fucking clapped. Really? What ability? Into war. What ability? From 2017 onwards, it became resoundingly clear that Valve had no interest in creating a franchise league. With the LCS and Overwatch League being framed as the future of esports, people started to wonder whether Dota 2 would have a place in that future. And then, in August of 2018, OG provided an incredible, impassioned reminder about what makes Dota so unique. OG! OG! They've done, done it. it! They have they done it! They have done it! The power of flowers and friendship! I've done it here, ladies and gentlemen! Your grand 
champions of TIA! It's OG! Despite the primordial, monolithic status of All-Stars and the grand entrance of its near-perfect successor, Dota never became the biggest esport in the world. And chances are, it never will. But that's okay. Because if TI8 taught us anything, it's that Dota isn't about angel investors. 37 million, baby. Car sponsorships. We just announced our partnership with Honda. Or sneaker deals. Make sure to check out the website, kswiss.com slash immortals. It isn't about popularity. Wow, like why is that me? Or profitability. Dota viewing, it's, uh, viewers watching, your game's dead, okay? It's about community. Dota is a game that unites everybody. It doesn't matter what country you're from, what race you are. It's kind of like a bond that is shared. Normally, normally. I can't thank you enough for opening up yourself and your family and sharing your story with everyone. It's about challenging yourself. Oh, what's up, bitch? Ooh, we got him. Let's go. Woo! Big W coming out from the dragon. It's about capturing the hearts and minds of competitors and turning them into champions. It's about building an esport that's fueled by nothing except a pure, unadulterated love for the game. Holy shit, guys! Holy shit! Yes, it's Seb! Seb! Come on, it's fueled! Seb! It's fueled! Seb! It's about making something out of nothing. The game is free to play, but it stays afloat because people love it so much. It's about loving this beautiful. unforgiving genre defining game so much that it becomes a part of who you are and when you think about it isn't that kind of the point Thanks for watching. If you want more great content just like this, be sure to hit the subscribe button.